All right, first let's start by talking about um, what a mining operation actually looks like because uh, I think there's a lot of application developers here who just see mining as this thing that goes on in the background. Um, but there's quite a lot to it. It's a complex process. So um, I might throw to, uh, to Liam to, to begin with. Uh, can you explain what are the, the major components of a mine, mining operation? Yeah, so um, obviously we have the miners, the ASIC machines in their thousands out in a warehouse somewhere. They're talking to a uh, piece of software, which is actually the pool software. Um, they're talking a language or a protocol called Stratum. And um, they're basically saying, here I am, can I have some work? And we're giving them work yeah, based on the difficulty which we think we will get from them every seven seconds, a share. Um, the pool software itself is talking to Bitcoin node using RPC calls. And so the pool software is a middle layer in between the miners and the, and the Bitcoin node. They're never talking directly to the Bit Bitcoin node, but always through this pool software using Stratum. Okay. Um, and pool software, of course, brings to mind the idea of, uh, of mining pools, uh, which we all know and love. There's, there's many of them around, but there's also a lot of solo miners as well. Uh, do they make use of this kind of middleman software? Yeah, so if you're a solar miner, you can connect to a pool as well. And um, for example, SV Pool, we have lots of solar miners there who connect to it and they will get paid because the solar miner itself, if it connects directly to a Bitcoin node, it's never going to win or it's very unlikely to win the block mm. to, to come up with a low enough, enough solution. So instead of that, they get paid in a thing called shares, which is it's sort of for how much work they do, we will pay them a share of the block reward when we get it. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of a traditional uh, model that um, the, the, that three-layer model of ASICs, pool software and, and, and Node. Um, and that's, uh, I think, how almost all Bitcoin mining has operated uh, in the last 10 years to date. But that's not necessarily the only model. Um, I understand Enchain Research Team has, uh, has been exploring this area. So I'll start with uh, Owen, perhaps. Yeah, so we kind of see several distinctions in the entities that you would typically call uh, a Bitcoin miner. So uh, one of them will be the people that gather transactions and validate them and send them to perhaps another entity that constructs the block. Um, a third entity also might validate incoming blocks coming in. And these all have kind of different roles and different responsibilities and even kind of uh, legal challenges. The other uh, type of entity or collection of entities are the um, miners themselves, which uh, might be um, a bit clear if I refer to them as hashers that actually try and do the proof of work and find the nonce. Mm -hmm. um, and within this system, we uh, are trying to, uh, with Terranode, disentangle these particular features and make them as efficient as possible um, to get the maximum kind of utility from a mining operator. Uh, there's a fourth type of entity that Terranode, uh, I don't think, will touch on, which is what I would suggest miners might want to focus on now, which is a kind of data serving node. So this is going to be extremely important in the future as we scale to terabyte blocks, and data is going to be extremely uh, valuable, and access to that data will be um, a commodity. Mm -hmm. So, um in the white paper, Satoshi referred to uh, to, to, to miners, uh, although he used the words no, uh, word node, uh, which I think he used interchangeably. Um, but he referred to the fact that they can enter and leave the network uh, at will and catch up. So this data service that you're talking about, it, this is one of the, uh, the applications of it. Um, does that role necessarily need to be fulfilled by miners? Why? Um, so as Owen suggested earlier, we are trying to distangle the features in the mining node. So in terms of features, what a mining node have, um, a has is, um, first of all, storage. So you want to store uh, the full blockchain, and then you want to store the UTXO, UTXO set in the memory. So you have hard drive and memory. And then you have a bandwidth network. You want to communicate with other peers. You want you want to propagate or transmit your block uh, to other peers. And, and then finally, the mining or the SHA-256, so ASICs, basically. So what we want to do is disentangle all of them. So we have 
um, A6, which is just do hash and nothing else. And then we have um, a full node storage, which stores the full blockchain. And then we have a memory, which uh, stores all the UTXO sets. And then on top of that, we still have another one, which is the validation. So once we have that, we can actually see, we can provide service to many other entities. Once you have the storage, for example, you can provide service to ASICs. Now ASICs is decoupled, so that they need your service, they need the data, they need the block header. And then you can provide that service to merchant to provide zero conf. And then for the memory, you have UTXO set, which is a indication whether something is spent or not. And that indication can be used to indicate whether something is valid or not, for example, like a certificate. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things you can do um, to provide services to a lot of different types of entities. I think that would be the key for miners. Mm -hmm. And you know that could be an extra uh, revenue for them. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of uh, build upon these points, I think we might see quite a clear disentanglement between what I'd call block constructors who necessarily, I believe, will still have to always store a full copy of the blockchain, but it could be in very um, slow tape storage somewhere. But I think uh, that's very important to provide value for uh, those block constructors so that we uh, trust the uh, data they're serving to us. Mm -hmm. And I think they can outsource the hashing to the specialists in um, chip manufacturers and I think this will become even more important in the future as the block reward um, pools and the number of transactions increases. So I think Jimmy this morning said we can expect there to be maybe 40 or so BSV per uh, block, which is mainly transaction fees in the not too distant future. And also uh, the, uh, the reward in the 10 minute period is gonna change as well. So I could imagine that as a mining pool, you have SLAs with your kind of core group of hashes mm -hmm. that are guaranteed to give you hash power in those 10 minutes. But as you get closer to the 10 minutes and even beyond if a block isn't found, the uh, potential reward goes up, could be quite considerably. And at that point, you might want to appeal to a distributed hash market where I say, okay, at this point, if anyone is willing to take on this challenge, then I'm gonna um, pay them a fraction of the block reward. And that has its own challenges, uh, which is a kind of research topic here at Enchain, which is what you're trying to do is ask for the most important piece of data, which is a, a valid nonce mm. in a completely distributed system where you don't trust anyone. And that's, uh, you can appeal to kind of cryptographic uh, techniques to atomically exchange that in a, a distributed uh, manner. So I see that could be one of the futures um, of how uh, mining is more distributed yeah. within the network. Okay, well, we're starting to creep into the business side of, of mining now. Um, we've described uh, a lot of the complexities that go into operating uh, the actual node itself, but from the miner's point of view, uh, until uh, today, that's really been uh, quite simple because it's, uh, it's one little piece of software that you, you just run called Bitcoin SV node, and um, it sort of takes care of all of that for you. Um, and so I think... The focus from the miners' side uh, over the last uh, 10 years and, and, and even still now is, is more on the business operation of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with the hashes, uh, the hashing units, etc., uh, and operating the pool itself. So um, I'd like to ask our two resident miners here, and I'll begin with, uh, with, with Lise. Um, what is it that investors in a, in a, in a mining operation uh, sort of care about? And I imagine there's two types of investors. There's the ones that worry about the pool side of things, and they're the ones that worry about the, um, the hashing units, the, that actually operate the warehouses full of, full of mining equipment. Uh, 在场的可能很多人是了解过比特币过去十年左右的历史
。嗯，那么比如说从这个从个人矿工转变到矿池的这一个过程，那么也就是说参与挖矿的人会越来越多。那么越来越多的原因就来自于这个经济激励的模型是逐渐的被世人所认可的，所以有越来越多的人认为说参与挖矿不仅在维护着比特币的网络，同时它也能从这个过程当中获取一定的经济利益。那么这个经济利益是怎么来算的呢？也就是说，矿池以矿工他自己的工作量来向。呃，矿工去发放这个收益，收益的模式就是以比特币的形式。那矿工所承担的成本，就是说他购买硬件以及维护这个硬件的成本。维护这个硬件的成本，可能呃会分为分很多的层次，但是与刚才各位所说的话题有关的，比如说一个大型的呃矿池或者是大矿工，他想运行一个自己独立的节点的话。那就涉及到刚才各位所说的，可能在硬件层面的支持以及软件上的这些优化。然后这个这刚才这一部分呢，就是说矿工的收益性。那么以矿池的收益性来呃来去讲这个挖矿的生态，也就是说矿池的收益来自于说它以呃集合它所有客户的算力，然后一起作为一个整体的挖矿的节点去做这个出块竞争。再把他所获得的这个出块的收益去分发给他的矿工，这看起来是一个很简单的一个过程，这也是我们常说的 proof of work 工作量证明的一个过程。但是呢，这个过程在过去的两年间发生了非常大的变化。啊，这也是呃 BSV 一直所强调的，为什么我们一定要强调这个不断的扩容？因为挖矿的收益主要来源于两部分，一部分是固定的这个区块奖励，目前是 12.5。呃，不论是 BTC、BCH 还是 BSV 都是。但是呢，还有一个很重要的部分就是交易手续费，交易手续费在过去的很长一段时间里都微不足道，大多数时间，比如说比特币历史的前几年，可能呃，甚至交易手续费连百分之零点一都不到，然后直到。呃，到现在吧，应该是从百分之一或者到百分之十波动的区间。但是矿池在过去的呃比特币产生的大概前九年的时间里，是不会向他们的客户以及矿工分发这个交易手续费的。而这一切是在二零一八年，也就是去年年初，才有很多家大的矿池逐步的开始改变了这个交易呃收益分发的模式。他们开始向他们的矿工去分发这个交易手续费了。那么这样一个经济驱动来自于哪儿呢？就是来自于2017年底的一个大牛市，就是比特币的价格上升了很多。上升了很多的时候，大家发现区块奖励 12.5 比特币，但是交易手续费甚至可能在某一些的时间甚至超过了这个区块奖励的数额。所以呢？矿工们就不愿意了，他希望矿池认为说这也是我劳动的所得，所以你应该把这一部分的区块呃就是交易手续费分给我，呃，那么对现在来说，为什么我们一直要主张说一定要让区块打破这个上限，让这个区块里的这个交易变得更多？是因为我们知道基于比特币的这个呃系统，每过大概呃。三到四年的时间，它的区块奖励都会减半。那么，我们如何维持这个经济模型持续的运转？我们就需要把这个呃交易手续费不断的提升。交易手续费提升，我们又希望这个网络是良性的，有更多的人愿意在上面去做交易。那么，我们肯定是不愿意让每一笔交易的手续费高，而是要把交易足够的多，每一笔交易手续费降下来，导致它每一个区块能够装下的这个交易手续费的总额。是比较高的，这样才是一个可以在长久、未来几年或者几十年都能够良性运转的一个网络。嗯，要说的就是这些。OK， thank you. It's good to hear. Uh, oh, that's loud. It's good to hear uh, uh, what happens on the inside a mining operation because it's uh, it's somewhat opaque to uh, to a lot of us. Um, Another thing I wanted to ask about the um, the business side of it is: uh, uh, do um, do mining pools generally have uh, a single kind of payment policy, or for, for for all of their mining pool members, or do they sometimes establish like you know uh, individual uh, business relationships with with different miners, perhaps larger ones? Is this? 是指矿池的一些支付方式，对吗？
Are you asking the payment method? Uh, no, I'm just I'm just asking to the um, uh, to the miners uh, that are members of a mining pool. Uh, do they all operate on the same terms, or, or do some of them uh, have uh, you know their own? Own negotiated terms. 目前的矿池，他们向矿工发放收益，分为大致分为三种模式。嗯、呃，比较常见的一种模式是，呃，矿池会将整个网络相对来说一整天平均的所有区块的交易平均交易手续费，然后以这个为基础分发给他们的矿工，不论这个矿池它当天自己获得的手续费的百分比是多少。这是一种方式，另外一种方式比较常见的呢，就是说这个矿池只向矿工分发他们自己当天生成的所有区块所获得的交易手续费。然后第三种方式呢，就是说这个矿池它不仅只呃只分发它自己挖出来的区块的交易手续费，它也只分发它自己挖出区块的这一部分。嗯、呃，当然，这个可能听起来会感觉对大多数没有挖过矿的人会觉得比较陌生。嗯、呃，但是总的来说，就是交易手续费现在矿池都是要分发出去的。既然要分发出去的话，就会形成我作为一个矿工，我在不同的矿池呃去连接不同的矿池挖矿的时候，你的收益就会出现差异。而矿池，因为它基基于市场竞争以及整体目前形成的这一种经济秩序下，矿池是不得不向它的客户去分发它的手续费的。那么，如果他想争取到更多的客户，以及让他矿池能够长久的运运行以及获得收益的话，他就需要在这个抓取更多交易、获得更多手续费的这个事情上要做努力。目前，嗯。每家矿池，他们大概收取的整体的手续费大约是百分之二到百分之四左右。那么大家知道，目前的这个整个网络的交易手续费应该是在百分之一上下浮动。也就是说，一旦未来，嗯、呃，我们的交易手续费可能在整个区块里的占比是非常高的情况下，那么你一旦没有比别的矿池手续费的呃交易手续费。高的话，那么你可能会损失掉你所有的这个收益，因为你只向你的矿工收了百分之二左右的手续费而已。就这样。Okay, I think、um, just continuing on the theme of the the business side of、uh, of a mining operation, I'm going to start with Lynn actually, and then come back to 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 Lise.、Um, I'd be interested to hear like what actually are the major costs of of running a mining operation.、Um, I start with Lynn because you really cross the spectrum. You operate your own hashing units, I believe,、uh, as well as operating a pool that other people join uh, uh, into. And、uh, <clears throat> I understand you're uh, you're, you're uh, exploring new and interesting ways to、uh, to, to extract revenue out of、uh, out of a mining operation or the synergies、uh, involved in it. So,、um, can you tell us a bit about where 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 do the major kind of cost centers come from in in a mining operation? Uh, okay. I think, for mining operations, we are exploring different sources of revenue. In my view, I see it as a collection of sources of revenue that are collected by the users. These s o u r c 正在创业的我们，刚才看到那些使用比特币 SV 账本的这些应用程序，这些应用程序创造了价值，他们的价值是由由用户通过 Bitcoin SV 以手续费的方式进行支付的。所以，从我作为矿工和矿池的这个视角来看，我愿意和开发者建立一个长期持续的合作关系。然后借助开发者的力量，从用户手中收取到用户的手续费，并且因为矿工之间存在很强的竞争，那么这个手续费会降到一个非常低的这个水平。我们大家是通过海量的、大量的用户的需求来获取一定的利润的。OK。嗯。OK。Let's、uh, let's let's turn now to、uh, back to the node、uh, side of things.、Uh, sorry, actually, I was going to turn the question to to, to you, Lise.、Um, the cost bases of, of running a mining operation.、Um, what what are the significant ones、uh, from your your point of view, in terms of what 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 do you have to spend money on to to operate a a mining 
um, company? Hmm. 在我上一个工作里面，就是呃，矿池的运作主要是呃，想要获取更多的矿工，因为我们知道现在的呃，整个网络的这个挖矿的算力上升的非常的快。当你如果呃一个矿池没有积累足够多的算力的时候，你会发现你在整个网络当中作为一个挖矿节点的力量是非常的弱的。嗯，有可能你在整个网络里占的这个算力的比例是非常的低，导致你可能，呃，一天都不出块或者是连续好多天都不出块但是呢，这样子你依然要向你的客户去发放这个挖矿收益，那这样子矿池就会承担非常大的这种资金或者是流动性的风险。所以，首先作为任何一家矿池。呃，积累足够多的算力，或者是他从外部获取足够多的客户，这都对他来说是一个很重要的一个呃，算是使命吧。然后另外一方面呢，就是要尽量的降低矿池的运行成本。嗯、呃，像各位所说的，运行一个节点其实是有成本的，不管你是服务器成本、软件优化的成本，以及长期运维的成本，这一点林哲明先生肯定比我懂得会更多。所以这一部分的成本，我们肯定是希望能够尽量的降低，在维持整个矿池运行没有问题，而且稳定、连接性好的时候，要尽量的降低。嗯、呃，还有一点就是，我们的客户矿工是分布在全世界各地的，比特币整个网络都是通过呃互联网来连接在一起的。这样子的话，对于一个矿池来说，你的客户可能是来自于世界各地，他们在各个地方有可能网络情况不好，或者他的整体的运维状况不好，这样就会形成客户他自己同矿池的这种连接性会产生很大的波动。啊、呃，这样子的话，客户他会在无无意之中会受到一些损失。那么这些损失的责任是从哪里来？我们有没有办法去优化？这个都是矿池的一些挑战。Mm -hmm. Can I just um, develop that point a bit further in terms of kind of operational costs? So I think in the not too distant future, uh, one way to lower your operations costs is to make additional streams of revenue through um, data serving. And this, I think, if quickly in the early days, might lead to a, a bottleneck in terms of um, how much data you can store and serve to a large number of uh, recipients quickly. And uh, at the moment, I think that will have a positive impact on BSV in the sense of lowering fees. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, you know, miners don't really want this data and you're paying the fee to have the privilege of them storing it for you. But as we move to um, much larger blocks with uh, data that everyone can access and use, they, the miners will, will want that data. They'll want you to give it to them so that they can make money serving it. Mm. And I can also imagine at the moment, we've had this uh, in the last 10 years of Bitcoin, we've had this kind of arms race for um, hardware chips, so who can make the most uh, efficient chip, most powerful chip, will get the uh, biggest block reward potentially. Um, but I think as Lee's mentioned, like sometimes you might not even mine one block per day, and this, these other mechanisms can give you that source of revenue. And I think we'll see an arms race in the future for uh, data and serving that data. I think it won't necessarily be the storage, because we already have very good, powerful, solid state storage um, mediums, it'll be more like the infrastructure and how we can pipe it to a, a huge global demand. And we'll see uh, a kind of arms race for the best, most efficient uh, infrastructure. I think this is actually going to have a hugely positive effect on um, everyday person as well, because this infrastructure is about quicker connectivity worldwide. And I think there was a kind of good example of that a couple of months ago in one of the stress tests that they had issues with the uh, Chinese firewall. They literally just couldn't pipe enough data through and some nodes uh, dropped off the network. So there's also kind of political um, mm. uh, factors that we have to consider and this could be mean a good kind of motivation for opening up kind of countries to uh, communicate more with a higher volume. Um, and I think it's, it could be a really good social kind of um, impact for this. I think this is a good uh, good time to ask for an opinion from uh, Liam because uh, not only do you wear uh, a couple of hats, uh, being an operator of what's or the, one of the founders of what's on chain, um, and uh, have had to steer what's on chain through a few uh, 
uh, stress tests, um, but you also are one of the pilots behind uh, a mining operation as well on both sides of the firewall. Um, so what sort of challenges have you, you faced uh, in, in these times when, when stress tests are happening? Um, so we have a considerable number of miners in China on the other side of the firewall. Mm. And, um, but we do have actual pool software in China. So communication between the miners and the pool is all done on one side of the firewall. Mm. And the pool communicates with a node on that side of the firewall as well. So it's, it's not so, such a big problem for us. The nodes were lagging behind with the, with the transactions in the mempool, so we did see a bit of a uh, problem when, you know, when, the, uh, when the scaling test was taking place. But um, yeah, it, was, it, it resolved itself eventually. So this was a problem of network bandwidth in yeah. and out of China. Exactly, yeah, the node wasn't getting... The it. node itself, yeah. yeah. Um, can anyone think of any novel ways that we can, we can solve that problem, multiplexing? Uh, leaps to mind. The idea of splitting, the, of, of having an agent on both sides of the firewall that actually uh, collects all the transactions from each side and then splits it across multiple pipes uh, across the firewall. Um, it's a problem that I've been thinking about since well, before Bitcoin SV even uh, was, uh, was born or, or, or reborn rather because um, in the lead up to November last year I had a number of conversations with, with miners um, BCH miners uh, in China to try and find out what their real concerns were, and this was the key one. Um, one of the first solutions that leapt to my mind was just don't run nodes in China. Use the new mining APIs, which are very, very efficient uh, in terms of the amount of bandwidth uh, um, that they consume um, and connect to, to nodes outside of China, but that doesn't really solve the problem completely because uh, you've still got to get the transactions from one side of the firewall uh, to the other. So. Um, I guess this is one of the rising challenges of, of operating nodes in a, in a scalable world, and we certainly will see more of these challenges, uh, but we'll, we'll find ways to overcome them. Um, in terms of block propagation, um, Lynn, maybe I'll ask you, um, have you um, observed any problems in the, in the block propagation times, etc., during stress tests? and, and and what do you plan on doing to, to get past those problems? Uh, ,对我们目前对网络的观测来看,我们在全球部署了很多观察的节点,这是不算节点,就是很多观察的服务器,这是我们自定义的一个代码组成的用来监听,目前P2P网络上面的消息的一个工具,通过这样的工具,我们可以
可能的矿工。这样的话，呃，我们之后只要告诉矿工我们当前出块是在哪一个版本上进行的，那在这种情况下，我们也可以减少对于高并发状况下就是呃高带宽的这种需求。这些优化都是我们当前是已经可以正在进行的事情。呃，在将来，我其实认为有可能会出现，呃，另外一种情况，就是因为我们的交易来源其实是由应用程序产生的，所以不同的应用程序之间的交易是基本不会有干涉的。所以，当矿工和不同的应用程序合作的时候，是可以在不同的应用程序之间进行分片处理的。那么，在这种情况下，它可以。最大化的节约当前的这个工作量，比如说我们会发现有一部分的用户它都是来自于呃美国或者欧洲 ，OK， 那我由我们的美国或者欧洲的服务器来专门处理这部分的交易，而一部分的交易是来自于中国大陆境内，那么我们会由中国大陆境内的服务器来处理这些应用程序提交过来的交易 ，OK， 通过这样的方式，我们有可能可以加快交易的处理的速度。来提升我们的交易出现的容量，因为我们并不需要花太多的时间在不同的应用程序的交易之间进行比对。这些应用程序对我们矿工提供的结果，其实是经过应用程序自身校验完成，由他们自己来保证的。如果应用程序提交的结果里面出现了错误的话 ，OK， 那么对我们矿工来说是一个估块的损失，就是我们会打出一个无效的块。但是对于应用程序来说的话，它会损失掉一个合作的机会，也就是如果他们不能保证 ，OK， 我以后就不跟他们合作了。所以在这样的情况下，呃，矿工是有可能在和应用程序建立良好的合作的基础上，极大的降低我们对应用呃对网络带宽的需求。谢谢。I think what you just said, or what you just described, sounds to me like、uh, you're actively researching and、uh, and taking steps to improve your your connectivity with the、uh, with the rest of the miners、uh, and the rest of the world. Which、um, um, I actually think that's quite profound because this is precisely the type of miner that. Satoshi Nakamoto described, and、uh, you may well be the first of these to actually start doing that job. So. I think、uh, I think Lin、uh, maybe、uh, deserves a round of applause for his、uh, his his active efforts. No. So we've talked about some of the rising challenges of operating nodes, and we've、uh, we, we've 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 seen some of the steps that are being taken. But let's let's turn to data storage. Um, um, We've got a little bit of a cross section here.、Uh, we've got miners that use prune nodes, and we've got miners that use full nodes.、Um, Liam, yeah, you're, you're one of the ones that uses prune nodes, but for what's on chain, I presume you use full nodes. Yeah, exactly. So all our well, miners. I shouldn't say full nodes. I should say archival nodes. Okay.、Yes. <laughs> yeah, obviously, what's on chain, we use a full node.、Um, for the Miners, I think it's more of a question of space, storage space. The reason we use prune nodes.、Um, in the future, obviously, if we're going to be making part of selling, or rather, the reading of、um, stored data, part of our business, then we're going to have to change that and run at least one full node on the mining、uh, side of things. And of course, what's on chain will be competing with this in in some ways, and I'm, I'm sure other applications will be as well. I mean. It's not a、uh, exclusive domain for miners, so I suppose what's on chain could also think about. Yeah, we'll provide access to this data for a small fee,、mm -hmm. and maybe in competition with the miners, which which would be a a good thing. You've extended the、uh, what's on chain beyond the boundaries, I guess, of a traditional、um, block explorer.、Um, yeah, well. I don't want to say too much because I've got a talk coming up <laughs> right after this. So <laughs> I, <won't, laughs> well, I do, do speak about that quite a bit.、So. Well, I, I can make this a yes/no question. Then I was want, wanted to ask if you thought about monetizing yes, services yes, in the yes. future. Yeah, I'll be talking about that later on. Okay. All right.、Um, well, I want to turn to the question now of、uh, of, of how miners can leverage、uh, data.、Um, There is、uh, some argument to be made that provision of data services requires、uh, quite a bit of crossover、um, in terms of the infrastructure that's required to do that、uh, with a mining operation. So,、um, 
do we envisage that miners are all going to become data providers? Um, I think, Lynn, you've already started in this area. Okay. Uh, I think every Bitcoin SV Archiving Note 在你投入了大量的基础设施的建设在提供了一个全量的交易的节点的时候你会发现在这个时候你同时在买一些矿机来参与挖矿你的边际收益是很高的那么这样的话会促进更多的全量我们讲图书馆节点的人变成矿工那
And then once you have that, all you have to do, or all, all you have to send to the um, uh, ASICs is just a block header. And what you get back is just a few uh, bytes, um, well, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, but it's in, byte, in hundreds of bytes. So that basically solves the uh, contradiction. It resolved the contradiction, and therefore you can have uh, places to mine uh, where you have very cheap electricity, and we're thinking you can even mine in the space where you can get the sol uh, so, uh, solar power. And the uh, communication between the mining equipment and your full node is actually quite, uh, the requirement is very low. So it becomes very um, plausible to do some like remote, remote mining. Mm. And then when you have the full node, um, you can Again, separate that. So my understanding is, if you talk about data service, right? What is the data there? So basically, you have three things. That's my understanding. So one is the full blockchain, right? And then the other two is the my, um, mempool and uh, the UTXO set. So the mempool have a lot of information. It probably will be the best source for zero conf. Once it gets in the mempool, it means it's validated. And if you have, uh, if you're a merchant and you connect to multiple uh, mining nodes, or rather full nodes, or mempool, then you probably get a very good picture how is your transaction propagated and how is that validated. Um, so basically you put a status on your transaction um, for the entire transaction lifetime. And then for the UTXO, as, uh, as I said earlier, you can actually do a lot of uh, binary encoding in the UTXO, uh, UTXO sets, because it's either zero or one, either spent or not spent. So you can basically present something you want uh, using a UTXO set, or using a, uh, sorry, use, using a UTXO or a set of UTXOs. So that's all the uh, things miners, or rather full nodes can provide. And in the future, when data gets, um, I mean the size of data gets larger and larger, the search becomes slower and slower. So it's, in, it's possible for miners to incorporate something like you know, a page rank uh, from Google, and then you sort out your data, and then you provide the best search for clients. So that could be something um, full nodes can look into. So I think there, there is a lot of business uh, opportunities there. I mean, data you know, is the future. So once you hold the data, you just have to think about how you can provide them to your clients. It sounds to me like we don't quite know how the, the future landscape is, is going to look. There's a lot of different options there. Un unfortunately, we are uh, out of time, which is a shame because I think we could uh, continue this discussion for another 20 minutes quite happily, but um, we, we have to move on with the agenda. So um, uh, can we please thank our panelists, Wei Zhang, Owen Vaughan, Liam Misson, Lise Lee, and Lynn Jemming.